Um, our next speaker is Eric Sundquist. Um, he's going to be speaking to us about um, the carbon cycle and telling us about um, CO2 and specifically um, the question of the missing sink for CO2 in the northern hemisphere. Um, Eric is a research geologist with the USGS and has been there since 1978. His research focuses on relationships between the global carbon cycle and atmospheric CO2, including effects of historical changes in land use, interactions between oceanic and terrestrial carbon cycling, exchanges of CO2 between soils in the atmosphere, and past natural variations in atmospheric CO2. He received his PhD in geological sciences from Harvard University, um, and he is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the chair of the American Geophysical Union Committee on Global Environmental Change. Um, I'm not sure if Eric is ready quite yet, but he, he will be shortly, I'm hopeful. So um, we'll give him a few moments. This is the culmination of an odyssey that began last Thursday when uh, the USGS was under court order to disconnect complete, completely from the internet. and. Um, my slides were being prepared electronically in Menlo Park, California, while I worked on them uh, in Woods Hole. Um, and uh, it's been an adventure. Um, uh, my talk is, is on the network for this meeting somewhere, but it hasn't been transferred to this computer. So I'm going to be using my own computer. Um, and I'm glad I have it here. It's a USGS computer. Um, and I'm told that later today I'll be able to connect it to the internet. Um, the global carbon cycle um, is a very appropriate topic, I think, for these uh, tutorials um, because uh, the, the global carbon cycle research community is an assemblage of people um, who are basically accustomed to venturing into areas of knowledge outside their own academic training. Um, this means that uh, it's a community that is completely comfortable with asking and being asked quote unquote dumb questions. What I'm going to try to do is cover uh, not only uh, what we think we know, but also some of the uh, important research needs. In the 1950s, uh, David Keeling at Scripps Institution of Oceanography was encouraged by Roger Revelle to begin a series of measurements um, that not too many people paid much attention to at the time. These were high precision, highly accurate, continuous monitoring of atmospheric CO2 concentrations at Mauna Loa and at the South Pole. In the top panel here you can see um, the most recent results from the continuation of this time series of measurements. Um, and in the middle panel, you can also see uh, comparable measurements now we have for methane in recent years. Um, and at the bottom, you can see uh, the temperature trends of uh, global mean near surface temperatures um, over the last 25 years. I picked this time scale because it's the time scale, it's the lifetime of a typical graduate student. Um, and this is um, the experience of most of the um, students in this room. Now, I should say that this, this uh, apparent correlation between atmospheric greenhouse gas trends and temperature um, would not hold up if we went back to the typical lifetime of a professor, say going back into the 40s and 50s, um, because the temperature uh, increase was not, uh, was not pronounced during that time. And this highlights um, the need for uh, realizing that there are many complications in the relationships between greenhouse gases and climate um, that are not apparent in looking at this slide. Um, I also want to focus on the details uh, that are evident in the um, exquisite precision of the atmospheric measurements. Um, in the top panel, you can see um, uh, that not only is atmospheric CO2 increasing, but there's a very pronounced seasonal cycle. You can see that the seasonal cycle is 180 degrees um, phase reversed between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And you can also see that the seasonal cycle is greatly attenuated in the southern hemisphere. Um, 
And you can also see that the mean concentration of CO2 in the northern hemisphere is a little bit higher than in the southern hemisphere. You can also see that there are some uh, interannual irregularities in that trend. Um, it's not a, a completely smooth trend, and I'll be talking a little bit more about those later. Uh, the interannual irregularities are particularly pronounced for methane. You can see that the rate of increase of methane concentrations has been decreasing in recent years. Now, if we look farther back, if we look at the last thousand years, the impact of human activities is, is quite pronounced in the greenhouse gas concentrations. In the top panel and the bottom panel, I show CO2 and methane respectively from analyses of bubbles trapped in polar ice cores. These bubbles can be dated precisely by counting the annual layers in the ice. Um, and these records are verified from polar ice in both the north and the south. Um, and it's quite clear that over the last 200 years, both CO2 and methane concentrations in the atmosphere have increased drastically. I've also shown for comparison um, in the middle panel a temperature record compiled by Mann and others uh, based uh, on instrumental records for the last 100 to 150 years and before that on proxy records, primarily analyses of tree ring data. And again, you can see that the recent, uh, there is a conspicuous recent increase um, in global mean surface temperatures and this is one of the primary reasons that uh, uh, many researchers, um, as summarized in reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the National Academy of Sciences, believe that there is now a, a, uh, an effect of human activities on global warming. If we look still farther back in time, again using data from bubbles in ice cores, um, we can see that there's a very tight correlation between changes in greenhouse gas concentrations, again CO2 on the top and methane on the bottom, and temperatures. Now the temperature record here is a local temperature uh, record inferred from stable isotopes in the same ice core in which the gas bubbles were extracted. Um, but this temperature record correlates very well with global uh, records of sea ice volume and temperature represented in, in the stable isotope uh, ratios of marine sediments. Now putting anthropogenic fluxes into the context of, of the geological carbon cycle, um, we can see first of all that the uh, exchanges that represent Anthropogenic fluxes, those are slightly tinted um, in that top row of arrows. And if I've got a, this is a pen. Oh, maybe it's not. I don't know what happened to this one. Um, oh, great, thanks. Um, yeah, there's a um, these tinted arrows um, representing the identified anthropogenic fluxes um, are, are uh, uh, exchanges with, with uh, the atmosphere and the atmosphere is relatively small in comparison to the uh, reservoirs that exchange with it and these natural exchanges between the atmosphere and land and the atmosphere and sea are much larger. Um, and also, I've also tried to depict in this diagram that there's a very wide range of time scales associated with different carbon cycle reservoirs and processes um, that influence atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Much of the attention on atmospheric CO2 and the carbon cycle uh, in recent years has been focused on the modern annual CO2 budget. Um, that CO2 budget is defined as a mass balance among sources of, and sinks of CO2 produced by human activities. It's very important to remember that when you hear talk about the global carbon budget, the global CO2 budget, um, in this modern context, it usually refers to the mass balance with respect to um, CO2 produced by human activities. Um, 
Uh, I've shown here uh, data taken from the IPCC reports of 1996 and 2001 um, uh, in which um, the Sources of CO2 due to deforestation and fossil fuels um, are added and from those can be subtracted the CO2 sinks, one in the atmosphere, um, one in the oceans. Um, the, the sinks in the atmosphere are of course directly measured. Um, the ocean sinks are modeled but fairly well constrained and you can see that there is, although there's quite a large range of uncertainty for the 1980s, um, there is a, um, uh, a need for a large net terrestrial sink um, in order to balance this global CO2 budget. Um, in the more recent IPCC report, we see an increase in the 1990s of the CO2 flux due to fossil fuels, but interestingly, not a notable increase in the rate of uptake of CO2 by the atmosphere. The ocean sink is about the same. Um, the IPCC report is um, uh, uh, less um, willing to uh, go out on a limb in terms of uh, this deforestation source and its balance against the so-called missing carbon sink um, over here. But you can see that if there is a deforestation source, as most people believe there is, um, that's comparable to that that existed in the 1980s, the need for a terrestrial sink in the 1990s is even larger. And um, uh, this, this need is discussed in articles, uh, large, quite a few articles that have been peer appearing in Science and Nature uh, during the last year. Um, one very recent article by Dave Schimmel, I believe in Nature, just in the last couple weeks. Now one of the reasons that um, this, this conclusion about the atmospheric CO2 budget and its implication of a uh, terrestrial sink that we can't identify um, comes from very highly precise measurements of atmospheric oxygen. Um, these measurements have been done in recent years by, among others, Ralph Keeling, the son of Dave Keeling. Um, and in the top panel, I show uh, a record uh, from a recent nature, nature paper by Battle and others um, showing atmospheric oxygen concentrations trending downward, atmospheric CO2 concentrations trending upward. Of course, oxygen is consumed when fossil fuels are burned. So that means there's an oxygen sink when there's a, fossil, when there's a CO2 source. Likewise, oxygen is released during photosynthesis um, when CO2 is consumed by plants. Um, so we have a, a, a nice um, a complement in these atmospheric oxygen measurements. Um, in the bottom diagram, I've shown a vector diagram taken from the recent IPCC report. Um, uh, and it's quite clear that the concurrent analysis of CO2 and oxygen um, represented here by a vector of CO2 and CO2 concentration changes and oxygen changes um, from year to year in the 90s. Uh, if we take this as representing a mass balance among fossil fuel burning, ocean uptake, and land uptake, we can see that this fossil fuel burning vector, um, which is very well constrained for both CO2 and oxygen, um, implies a combination of ocean and land uptake that is uniquely determined. Um, the reason that it's uniquely determined is that we know that um, this long-term trend in of decreasing oxygen concentrations is not reflected um, by a change in ocean uptake uh, over that time scale of, of uh, oxygen, whereas it is uh, the change in CO2 does affect ocean uptake of CO2. So we've got this horizontal vector here. Um, uh, the land uptake that's represented by this vector is totally consistent with the um, budget for the 1990s that is presented uh, in the IPCC report, which I just showed. We can also use oxygen, I'm sorry, atmospheric CO2 measurements to determine the location of CO2 sources and sinks. Um, in the top panel, I've shown that 
that there is a, as I showed actually in the original um, diagram of Keeling's results from Mauna Loa and the South Pole, um, there is a gradient uh, from north to south in CO2 concentrations. Uh, here for the 1990s, here for the 80s, these are both normalized to 1980s concentrations so that you can see the similarity in the gradient. That gradient, when combined with what we know about atmospheric mixing, um, constrains the CO2 budget, not only globally, but also for um, particular zonal regions. And uh, down here I've shown uh, uh, in brackets the um, uh, fossil fuel CO2 sources, predominantly in the northern hemisphere. Um, we know the rate of increase in the northern hemisphere. Um, we know the rate of mixing from the northern hemisphere atmosphere toward the south and the difference between uh, uh, the, the terms of the mass balance implies, again, a large terrestrial sink. Uh, and in this time, we can constrain it to uh, being uh, particularly large in the northern hemisphere. Um, this is a, a particularly vexing and important research problem now because, of course, um, this, uh, the terrestrial northern hemisphere is the part of the carbon cycle that we like to think we know the best. It is our backyard. Um, one very important thing to realize, to remember, when uh, looking at the global CO2 budget um, is that it fluctuates from year to year. Um, in this diagram, I've shown the year-to-year the -year variations in fossil fuel CO2 uh, fluxes to the atmosphere um, compared to uh, variations in year-to-year -year changes in atmospheric CO2 concentrations or atmospheric CO2 load. Um, you can see there's quite a large range of variations um, around this long-term mean, which is the, the long-term mean that's used in the CO2 budgets that I just uh, described. Um, and this emphasizes the, the, the importance of having these long-term measurements in order to understand long-term uptake of CO2. It's also important to remember that the CO2 budget is historical. It's inherently historical. Um, if we take um, the known atmospheric increase of CO2 over the last 150 years, um, we can use that atmospheric increase to drive ocean models that give us reasonably good estimates of ocean CO2 uptake. Um, and if we sum those two um, uh, forms of CO2 uptake and compare them in the bottom panel to a sum of emissions due to both fossil fuels and deforestation, we can see that the known uptake um, historically uh, does not um, add up to the total emissions. And again, there is a need for a terrestrial sink. Um, and we can see that this terrestrial sink has a history. Now, in order to understand um, uh, the, and be able to project atmospheric CO2 concentrations given um, uh, what we know about the modern annual CO2 budget, we need to know about processes. The process of ocean CO2 uptake begins with um, some very straightforward thermodynamics and gas exchange theory. In other words, basic chemistry. Um, CO2 reacts with water, um, dissolves in water uh, through gas exchange and reacts with uh, 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 dissolved organic carbon in surface seawater. These are well-known equilibrium relationships and they occur on timescales that are rapid relative to the timescales of ocean mixing, which are the timescales that determine how much CO2 is ultimately taken up by the oceans. Um, reactions between CO2 and carbonate sediments um, uh, specifically the minerals calcite and aragonite are also important for the long-term buffering of CO2 in the oceans, um, uh, but probably not important for timescales of decades. Um, there will be a couple of sessions at this meeting um, devoted to the relationships between atmospheric CO2 and carbonate dissolution and precipitation, um, but those will be uh, focused on longer geologic timescales. When we talk about ocean CO2 uptake, um, you will hear talk about two different kinds of pumps. Um, one is a biological pump whereby carbon is taken out of the ocean surface 
through biological production, photosynthesis, um, and returned at depth um, through mineralization of settling organic particles. Um, this affects depth profiles not only of dissolved inorganic carbon shown here, but also of dissolved oxygen, which is at a minimum level uh, due to uh, consumption of oxygen and in, in the oxidation of settling organic particles. Um, it's also reflected in nutrient profiles and in the stable isotope, uh, stable carbon isotope profiles. Now, um, there's also what's called a solubility pump, which is illustrated in this slide. And that is due to the increase in solubility of CO2 in seawater with decreasing temperature. Here illustrated by a comparison of measured total dissolved inorganic carbon concentrations um, with, uh, in the line, the concentrations that would be predicted by equilibrium with uh, the uh, PCO2 of the atmosphere at the time this particular data set um, was collected, which was in the early 70s. Um, the dissolved inorganic carbon concentrations are higher due to the higher solubility of CO2 in colder waters. Those colder waters are more dense and comprise the source waters for deep waters in the ocean. Um, as those deep waters sink, they carry CO2 with them, and um, hence they are also contributing to the enrichment of CO2 in the deep ocean. Um, it's thought that the solubility pump is the primary mechanism for removal of CO2 from the atmosphere into the oceans that the biological pump plays a relatively minor role at the present time. Ocean CO2 exchange is extremely variable both in space and in time. Um, uh, the signal here is in uh, the magnitude of the departures of CO2 from equilibrium here, which is what drives CO2 uptake in the surface ocean are on the order of tens of parts per million of CO2, um, uh, both variations spatially and temporally. And the, um, the, the global mean signal for uptake of CO2 on the order of two petagrams of carbon per year um, is on the order of 10 ppm CO2 difference between um, the surface concentration in the ocean and equilibrium with the atmosphere. And so you can see that there is a problem of discerning a CO2 uptake signal, the long-term CO2 uptake signal from natural variability. Um, it can be done. There are some very clever ways of using uh, historical oceanographic measurements to estimate the amount of CO2 that's stored in the oceans. Um, and those. Uh, those estimates compare fairly well with estimates that are based on ocean general circulation models that are combined with ocean carbon cycle models. You can see from a comparison of these two model results that an area of particular concern and uh, need for better understanding is in the southern ocean where there are big differences from model to model in the uh, estimated anthropogenic CO2 uptake. Now looking at CO2 uptake in the terrestrial carbon cycle, um, it's again important to recognize that CO2 uptake of anthropogenic CO2 um, is a relatively small signal compared to natural carbon cycling. Um, uh, I've just shown some of the terrestrial ecology lingo here. Um, this is gross primary production uh, globally on the order of 120 gigatons of carbon per year or petagrams of carbon per year. Um, uh, plants respire and the remainder is around 60 gigatons of carbon per year. That's net primary production. Um, soils um, respire uh, and uh, the plant debris that results from net primary product productivity is a large part of that respiration. Um, when that stuff decomposes, the, what's left is about 10 gigatons of carbon per year. That's called net ecosystem production. And finally, longer term production is um, a residual after what I've labeled here disturbance, which includes both natural disturbance and anthropogenic disturbance through mechanisms such as fire and erosion. Um, and uh, finally, we get um, our long term carbon burial on the order of one gigaton carbon per year, plus or minus. Again, it's a very small signal compared to the long term. Uh, I'm sorry, compared to um, the uh, natural fluxes. Um, 
Natural carbon storage on land is extremely variable spatially. Um, at this meeting you'll be seeing a lot of uh, sessions that are devoted to com combining remote sensing data uh, with models in order to infer carbon fluxes. Most of those carbon fluxes will be in the realm of NPP, that is net primary production, and NEP, that is net ecosystem production. Um, one of the major challenges in terrestrial carbon cycle research is to be able to go from those fluxes to estimates of long-term carbon storage. Um, one of the ways of doing that is by direct measurements. And here I've shown direct measurements of soil carbon. Um, in the U.S., this is from the StatsGo database. And uh, the main point I want to show here is the extreme spatial variability. Um, we can estimate carbon storage from these data, um, but you can see that it's extremely heterogeneous spatially. And it even gets worse when we look at the information in the StatsGo database. Um, for a single map unit, we see that that map unit represents a composite of different um, levels of soil carbon content um, that depends on depth and depends on landscape setting. The color code here is, is keyed to the one in the previous slide. Um, looking at historical effects of land use, we try to combine models with direct observations. In this case, the observations are observations of changes in land use based both on remote sensing on, and in historical records. Um, it's possible to use models of response curves of vegetation, soil, um, and what happens to organic carbon in forests when uh, they are chopped down and, and uh, uh, part of them is carted away as uh, timber or, or, or other wood products. Um, and when those uh, responses are uh, uh, concatenated through time, um, uh, uh, it's possible to come up with estimates of the uh, uh, amount of carbon that's stored in these various reservoirs um, over time. When those cohorts of land use effects are extrapolated on a continent scale, um, we can see this is the, uh, the, 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 the most widely cited um, estimate of changes in carbon uh, to the atmosphere as a result of land use change. You can see the continental distribution down here. Um, the primary uh, sources in recent years have been tropical deforestation. One of the most difficult aspects of trying to sort out different process influences on terrestrial carbon storage um, is the possibility of climate impacts on terrestrial carbon storage. Um, there are both positive uh, feedbacks and negative feedbacks to global warming um, that can be demonstrated at particular locations. Um, in this case, um, uh, there is evidence in looking at atmospheric uh, seasonal CO2 trends um, in the northern hemisphere um, at high latitudes for a longer growing season in the northern hemisphere. Um, and there's also a, a long known uh, positive feedback um, uh, response of soil respiration to increasing temperatures, which would tend to increase um, atmospheric uh, releases to the atmosphere as things get warmer. So sorting out these climate influences is very difficult. Um, there is also evidence for CO2 fertilization of uh, the terrestrial biosphere. Um, this is known uh, very clearly from individual plants in greenhouse settings where CO2 is enhanced in the greenhouse. There are many questions about whether this fertilization um, is effective at the ecosystem scale and natural settings. Um, this shows um, a recent experiment um, in the Duke Experimental Forest uh, these circles are towers um, that are emitting CO2 um, into enclosures, uh, actually open enclosures, um, where CO2 is maintained at enriched levels. Um, the CO2 uptake is monitored inside these circles and compared to outside the circles. Um, the initial results from this experiment show that there was an enhanced CO2 uptake but longer term results have now shown that the CO2 uptake has greatly attenuated um, and there's some question about whether it's statistically significant except in areas where um, uh, plant growth has been enhanced by the availability of chemical fertilizers. Um, one of the most widely used methods for looking at the terrestrial CO2 uh, uh, carbon budget 
um, is something called eddy covariance. Um, it's basically a measurement in which um, uh, me uh, uh, wind speeds are are measured from towers and correlated with um, CO2 concentrations. The vertical component of wind speed is correlated to changes in concentrations and that's a way of estimating the net flux of CO2 away from the land surface. Um, you can see in these results, again, there is a significant net, uh, significant interannual variability. Um, there are surprises um, in the history of carbon cycle research and in its future. Um, this exemplifies one of those surprises. Um, this was a, an idea that came from a geologist studying sedimentation on land um, who found that enhanced erosion is leading to enhanced sediment burial and if that enhanced erosion is accompanied by continuous supply of soil carbon um, to sites of burial, that could be a terrestrial carbon sink. It happens to be concentrated in northern temperate latitudes, which is very intriguing for those of us who are trying to resolve the current annual CO2 budget. Um, again, climate feedbacks are very important um, and can uh, are a major source of uncertainty in looking toward future changes in climate and CO2. And finally, um, uh, uh, what's needed in, in CO2 research is more integration both across disciplines and across temporal and spatial scales. Um, we certainly need more data. Um, we certainly need more innovations in modeling and analysis. And above all, we need open minds um, because we're sure to encounter more surprises, um, particularly because the carbon cycle and climate are so closely interactive that they have to be considered components of the same system. And I hope that's a segue to um, the next talk on climate modeling.